So welcome everyone that made it today. Uh, this is our third UW Reality Lab lecture of 2023. Uh, today we are being joined by Thomas Lewis. He is uh, a spatial computing cloud advocate lead at Microsoft, where he's actually been for the last 20 years. Um, he manages the AI and data advocacy teams at Microsoft. He's over that time span, worked with a variety of developers, designers, researchers on a myriad of topics. Uh, but one of the big focuses right now is mixed reality. Um, so today, Thomas is going to be talking with us about the metaverse, actually, and you know what that actually means. We've we've all heard that word thrown around a lot recently with some other companies maybe co-opting that term a little bit too much. Um, but hopefully we'll uh, clarify a little bit about what that actually means for the, the future of mixed reality and kind of the general immersion of, of, of civilization and uh, how we interact in, in virtual and mixed reality in the future. So with that said, uh, Thomas, I'll hand it over to you. All right, thank you. I am a uh, spatial computing advocate and a developer advocate uh, lead for uh, Microsoft. Uh, I'm part of an organization called uh, Developer Advocacy. And uh, the good part of my job is that uh, I'm not a salesperson, so I uh, don't uh, intend to sell anyone on uh, anything. What uh, hopefully uh, I can do is to get you excited about uh, uh, the technologies and the uh, you know concept of the of the metaverse and kind of get your framing around um, how to think about it um, in what you're doing today um, at the university um, as well as as you think about jobs and a, a career um, in this uh, in this space. Um, of course, uh, if you're uh, interested in uh, getting to know more about this space and some of the other things that we do, um, you can always follow me on uh, Twitter. Um, I'm at Tommy Lee. Uh, yes, I do sometimes get confused for the uh, drummer from the uh, by band uh, Motley Crue. Um, but uh, if you go to Tommy Lee, uh, you'll get very different uh, tweets uh, from there. Um, and then also you can be uh, follow me on LinkedIn. Um, so I'm at aka.ms Thomas Lewis LinkedIn. And uh, I would actually encourage uh, anyone, um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I do try to respond within uh, 24 hours if possible. Um, and I'm glad to help out to answer um, any questions or if you're thinking about, hey, I'd love to get a job in this space. You know, what are the things that I can do? Um, and I even uh, attempt to provide uh, folks with uh, uh, you know, uh, job, uh, you know, guidance and advice. So if you want me to sort of look at your, what you've been doing and kind of give any uh, guidance, I'm glad to uh, do that as well. So uh, opening that up to, uh, to folks uh, here uh, on the call and uh, probably folks who will be uh, looking at this uh, later. So with that said, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, talk about the context of why are we having this conversation in, in the first place? And, uh, and also too, like, why are people so excited about the metaverse? Um, and then second of all, why, are, why even the metaverse? What is the metaverse providing for us that maybe we don't have um, today? And then I'll give you a couple of use cases. Um, so this isn't just some kind of ethereal topic, but it's something that uh, people are actually using today, and we'll we'll talk about that. Um, then I'll talk about sort of what are the what's the metaverse evolution. So what is it that we have today, and kind of what do we see? Um, going forward and what are the things that we can think about. And then, of course, next steps um, on your journey. The other thing that I'll be doing is I'll be throwing in some uh, uh, kind, of, kind of Thomas anecdotes of kind of how I think about things as well. I've been very fortunate uh, to have this job to kind of delve into these things, but I've also been reading the books, reading the academic papers um, as much as I can to get sort of insight and perspective and, and more importantly, different perspectives um, on things. And so you'll probably see uh, me talk about some things uh, in a deeper way that maybe other folks uh, aren't, because I think a lot of times, a lot of the presentations are about, oh, the hype and the how, you know, getting people just excited about sort of this very, future sci-fi view of the metaverse and mine will probably be a, a bit more practical uh, in nature. So with that, let's jump in. So with the context, I wanted to provide um, 
We've been since the 70s going through different computing paradigms. Um, back in the 70s, um, and this is when I was a little kid, I remember my dad, um, he worked with uh, computers. Um, and computers were in these really huge, highly air-conditioned rooms, which had these uh, um, ceilings and floors that were kind of raised so that all the equipment and uh, power lines and everything could go to these big, huge computers, um, which um, would take up an entire room. Uh, but funny enough, um, that processing and computing power is probably in your phone in your pocket um, today. Um, and so we started this kind of personal computing paradigm, which was, hey, people could actually have a computer in their house. And I was very, very privileged that uh, I was, uh, you know, a, literally a little kid and I had a computer in my room because my dad, um, there was a computer they were getting rid of. Um, and it was this uh, laptop. Well, it was called, it's called the laptop at the time, but it was really a desktop. And it was a, uh, it looked like a piece of luggage. It actually had a handle on it. And then you put it down on its side and uh, you put the, uh, the uh, keyboard down. And then you had probably about a screen about this big. Um, and I learned uh, DOS and BASIC uh, by manuals that actually came within it, uh, which again goes back to kind of how ancient it, it, it was. Um, but that was kind of personal computing at the time. And then it continued to grow and expand as we all kind of learned about PCs and things like that. And then, of course, the second paradigm was the web. The web really changed everything because typically we were maybe networked together within an organization, but the networking outside of your organization was pretty non-existent. So that information at your fingertips um, really depended on, you know, what applications you had went to the, the store and bought, right? There was no concept of let's just go and download until we had all these web technologies. And then, of course, we continue to grow, right? We get then get into the aughts, and we now have mobile and uh, cloud that are just a part of everyday th day things. In fact, um, most people's first computers now are phones or iPads, you know, or devices um, that they uh, use. And and so we've kind of gone through these and these shifts kind of happen about every 10 years. And so everyone has been like, well, wow, what's that sort of new shift? And what we think is, is that these things don't occur in a vacuum, right? Um, it works, um, the things kind of develop based on sort of societal and cultural trends. Um, for example, a lot of people go, uh, just kind of assume like, yeah, everyone has a phone and it's in their pocket, um, but used to, that was a very, very unusual and odd thing. In fact, a lot of people when first had these, these devices, um, it would be considered um, almost rude to be on those devices. And now we understand that like, hey, you know, we can kind of talk and text at the same time, or we can have, you know, different uh, modes of, uh, of conversation that happens with this. And then also, too, you just have like what's kind of going around. So today, for example, um, we are very focused on hybrid work. Um, and a lot of this has to do with COVID and uh, what, what happened there. So pre-COVID, yeah, there were some folks who were doing remote work. But now what we're starting to see is um, remote work sticking around and being called hybrid work, where maybe someone would come into an office or come into um, a place, um, but at the same time, they may just be doing things, you know, from their own home. And this actual uh, presentation is an example of that, where uh, we're actually doing this and uh, anyone can see this um, around the world. But then also, too, there's a lot of these different things that are starting to happen, like AR-enabled navigation and immersive gaming and, of course, artificial intelligence, which uh, continues to kind of grow and expand from its sort of, you know, countercultural uh, roots uh, way back uh, when. And so for us, uh, we think the next evolution in computing is this concept called um, the metaverse, and that's what we're going to be talking about uh, uh, for the next uh, hour. So let's talk about why the metaverse. Um, there's a, there's a few there's three kind of pivots that we tend to take a look at. Um, so one is how are people and or humans connecting with each other? Um, 
human connection is, is a big part um, of ourselves. Um, even as someone like me who is an introvert, um, you know, you think like, oh, these are just people who want to just kind of be by themselves and alone. Um, no, they just have a sort of a dinner, different way that they get energy, right, from being around people or being around themselves. But what has happened is, is we've seen that uh, people want to connect and they want to connect in deeper ways. Because, for example, yes, we're all on Zoom or Teams or, or what have you, um, but it's still not the same as that kind of in-person, um, uh, you know, direct engagement uh, between two, two humans. And Metaverse is kind of going to be helping us with that. Um, also, we now have new capabilities um, than ever before um, with the Metaverse. And so, for example, um, I'm a big fan of The Cure. And uh, they're getting to the point where they're probably going to have one of their last tours, um, and it'll make me very sad. But what's great is that if the last, you know, presence that they have is somewhere on on the planet, um, I'll be able to watch them if they have a metaverse um, presentation of of that. And again, it doesn't have to be them doing a traditional, you know, stage presence. Um, they could do it anywhere, right? So they could, you know, basically do a con concert on another planet or in a totally, you know, uh, different type of uh, experience, maybe in Roblox or maybe in one of the many other uh, different sort of worlds, uh, virtual worlds that exist. Then also with the metaverse, um, we can kind of plan ahead and be future ready. So we can use um, technology such as uh, digital twinning, and we'll talk about that a bit more, um, to kind of think about what we can do in the future. So for example, um, we could you know, create a smart building for people um, to live in, um, and we can kind of play out different scenarios and things like that to see how, how that would uh, work and how we could uh, think about that. And so the metaverse kind of starts to expand what it is that we can do. Now, I think a lot of people on this call probably would be very interested in like, okay, this is all great and everything and sounds like it's this ethereal, wonderful sci-fi thing. But uh, hey, at the end of the day, you know, I'm interested in jobs and opportunities in this space. And what's great is, is that um, all of the um, analytics that have been done trying to think about like how big will this uh, space be, um, it's grown, it, it's going to be very significant. And you can see these numbers with Bs on them, right? So billions of dollars. And that's why you see a lot of companies jumping in on this, because you may have wondered like, okay, yeah, like, you know, Facebook changed their name to Meta to kind of show that there were, that they think this is a really big deal. All kinds of other companies are jumping into the fray for this. And why is that? Well, because there's, there's a lot of money in this because of the, we're looking at not only supporting the enterprise, but also supporting consumers as well. Now, the consumer market right now is fairly low because the devices usually are pretty expensive, especially when you're talking about uh, augmented reality devices. So a lot of the money is coming from the enterprise right now. But what we'll do is we'll slowly see that shift happen over the next few years as consumer devices come aboard. And we'll talk about sort of the consumerization um, of the metaverse uh, as well. But uh, this is something that, uh, you know, if you're sort of putting in that investment at university or where have you, um, it is definitely going to pay off because we are sort of at the beginning of this uh, journey and you're kind of positioned at the really, really wonderful place in the, uh, in the beginning. Now, the challenge is, is that if you try to find out what is the definition for the metaverse, um, you're going to get all kinds of uh, de definitions. And Unfortunately, a lot of the definitions are going to depend on who is who is talking about it. So if you're talking to a big tech company, um, you can imagine that uh, how they define the metaverse will be very much aligned with uh, what their core value is and uh, where they make um, money. Um, so it's been very hard. So if you ever have just kind of been like, okay, this metaverse thing, it's really confusing. Uh, guess what? It's confusing to everyone. And there isn't a, a good sort of standard definition that we've all um, sort of agreed to. And as you can see here, many different people will call it different things. So some people will say, oh, well, you know, 
you, you Roblox is its own metaverse, right? And and then, like I said, then we all debate is like, can one place, you know, can one thing be a metaverse or are these microverses and things like that? And, uh, you know, a lot of people love to pontificate on those kinds of things. Now, myself personally, I've come at it from a different view than probably most of, most of my counterparts um, because I think of the metaverse as sort of this conceptual North Star. So like if someone says, hey, we have a metaverse today, I probably will say I don't really think that we have a, we have a metaverse today. I think of it as something that we are moving towards where we will um, you know, go from augmented reality to virtual reality very seamless. We will have a variety of devices that are enabled um, in this way. So we will have things like the glasses I'm, I'm wearing today um, that will be enabled with this, uh, maybe, you know, bigger devices to do different things. And based on what people want to do, um, you know, they're going to have, they're going to have to kind of come at it from their different place. So when I talk about the metaverse, I look at it as this thing that's, you know, five, seven years from now to reach this point of kind of how everyone thinks about um, the metaverse. And so you'll hear me talk about sort of this conceptual North Star um, a lot. And uh, hopefully it kind of makes a little more sense than maybe kind of looking at everyone's specific definitions of what they think um, the metaverse is. Now, if I, if I can, uh, and by the way, I make no uh, money by promoting this, but uh, uh, Matthew Ball uh, wrote a book called The Metaverse and How It Will Revolutionize Everything. Um, if you want to get real nerdy into the metaverse, uh, I think this is probably the best book that's out there. There's a lot of good books, by the way, but I think that this one is actually the best because what he does intend to do is to provide us a definition. And this is the definition you can see. Um, but at the same time, he also talks about all the specific details of it, right? So how is it massively scaled? How is it in an interoperable network? Uh, you know, how does it perform synchronously, persistently, with unlimited numbers of users, things, all of these kinds of things. And what I like about it is, is that, you know, he sort of has a very practical perspective as well, where some of these things exist today, right? And we can take advantage of them. So things like avatars. But also he looks at things like, hey, what is the reality of being in a room of 100 virtual avatars reflecting all of their um, all of their uh, work in rendered real time so that if I am in Japan, um, that, you know, if I kind of shake my head no, everybody else in the world that is in this group will also see, see that at the same time and in real time. And so again, I'm, I always tend to uh, find myself enjoying things that uh, where, where people you know, they're, they're very positive, but they're also very practical about what are the things we need. And we're going to have to have real infrastructure in place. And that's why you'll see a lot of people when they talk about metaverse, they talk about like 5G and, and things and things like that. Um, so yeah, so if you uh, get a chance, go to the library, uh, check this book out, really great uh, book. And it's in a ton of different languages as well, if you're interested in a different language uh, to read from. Now, the metaverse, it's enabled by a set of technologies. We, we've talked about that. Um, that's, again, it allows for persistent digital representations connected to aspects um, of a virtual world and the real world, right? I think right now, all of the examples are virtual worlds because, to be quite honest, it's much easier to kind of control those things. And we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of history with that. Um, and basically, when we kind of think about this, we think about people, places, things, and processes. Um, I personally use this, um, this framing to decide whether or not um, we should, uh, or whether or not uh, a spatial solution is good for a particular problem. Um, one of the things we kind of constantly do is with any new technology, we try to apply it to everything, right? So uh, for example, nothing against blockchain, but everyone wants to use blockchain for every single thing um, out there. And we have now kind of come to that hype curve where it's like, okay, 
let's use it for the right thing. So when someone comes to me and says, hey, we're thinking of building out a metaverse solution or an AR solution, we'll talk through like, okay, well, what's the connection between the people, places, and things and processes? Um, and if a lot of those are missing, then most likely something else would do just as good of a job, right? So maybe a website or, a, or an app. And, uh, you know, you know, hey, I, I'm just a guy from uh, Microsoft who's passionate about this place. Um, you know, you might want to actually talk to a real doctor uh, like Dr. Ian Malcolm, <laughs> um, who uh, I, I always love this slide because a lot of times uh, people will, again, try to take a hammer to every uh, situation. And again, what I think we need to make sure that we do is we don't sort of overpromise, right? Like, oh, the metaverse will allow you to do all the things. I think having sort of a practical approach to it um, is, is the right thing. And uh, same thing with AI. This slide shows up in my AI talks uh, fairly often um, as well. So, uh, and again, if you're not familiar with Dr. Ian Malcolm, uh, he was a uh, in the uh, Jurassic Park uh, original movie. So just in case uh, someone never saw Jurassic Park, I don't want you thinking I was like, oh, who is this uh, professor uh, who I should be uh, following? All right, so again, we talk about these set of technologies, but really what are they trying to enable? Uh, kind of like, what is the foundation for the metaverse stuff that we were doing? So first off, we're gonna talk a lot about presence um, and we'll, we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. Um, also creating new immersive worlds um, and then simulating, predicting and, and automating. And this is where a lot of the interest is uh, right, right now. And then, of course, all of this has to be built on top of, you know, safety, security, and openness. And so I'm going to kind of go through each of these um, sort of individually. Um, so when we talk about presence, presence is that feeling and that connection that you have with someone. Um, that's like when you go and have a one-on-one -on -one, um, with someone or a meeting uh, with someone in person. Um, if you can share a virtual space, um, you do feel connected. Um, I have to say, I've been in, I would say, a thousand Teams meetings or um, Zoom meetings and things like that. And uh, I, I got to admit, like, there's not sort of that connection per se. But when I'm in an immersive virtual space uh, with folks, um, I find that it's much more compelling. And in fact, I retain those meetings and conversations way more than I do in a little magic square um, within uh, within teams or whatever you're whatever you use. And so that presence, I think, is very, very important. And I think that's one of the things that unfortunately, I can't describe to you the feeling per se, or I can't get uh, you to kind of empathize um, cognitively um, until you just do it, until you have that conversation within a virtual uh, meeting, right? Or I've been in meetings where uh, it's been an augmented reality where here literally in my home office, I'm talking to someone who is in Los Angeles, but I'm seeing their avatar standing right next to me as we look on the wall um, at the work and stuff that, that we're doing. And that experience is just way more than anything else other than actually meeting in person. And it's not unusual, right? Uh, I, I think I, I talk with everyone who's gone through COVID and hybrid work, um, and they all say like, hey, there's nothing like being in front of, in front of people and talking to them. Also, we want to be able to express ourselves um, with avatars um, that can, that show our uh, nonverbal cues. Um, they say communication isn't just talking, um, that most of it is nonverbal. So the way that someone is reacting um, is a person. Uh, one of the things that uh, I learned was uh, if a person doesn't want to talk to you or they're trying to like get away from the conversation, they will position their feet away from you. So even though they look like they're talking to you, they're positioning their feet away. And so usually that means that they're they're done. Uh, so just a little tip there, if you if you ever wondered. Um, but what's very important is that uh, we do have the way to express ourselves and we wanna express ourselves um, in the way that we want to be. And I'll talk about that uh, a, a bit more as we, as we go. 
The other thing is, is that we can have others see, you know, and teach others um, through uh, troubleshooting problems. So here on this kind of third, third part, um, you can see that there's a person who's working on something and then there's a person on the video and that person on the video is the expert. And so what's great is that um, instead of having to fly experts all around and to, you know, contribute to climate change, instead what we can do is we can have video and where the person who is the expert can see not only what is this person doing, but then also can kind of annotate. So they can kind of pinpoint and draw a circle and say, oh, this thing is plugged in at the wrong place. It needs to go over here and they can annotate that um, as well. And by the way, that is probably one of the biggest um, solutions uh, that Microsoft uh, does. Um, we have a, we have a, a product uh, that uh, does this kind of thing. And uh, it's amazing how much it uh, helps um, folks. Um, again, and to have expertise and not have to, but that expertise is interactive between the two. And then the thing we never want to forget is that we connect with others through, you know, creative play, competition, cooperation, and, and things like that. Um, a lot of times, uh, tech companies can make these kind of really cool things, like the metaverse, uh, seem kind of lame. And uh, the thing is, is that uh, the, this is going to be neat. It's going to be, again, kind of like the web is, where you can kind of find uh, where your tribe um, is that and can hang out together. So if you, let's say, are a huge fan of the movie Dune, well, guess what? Most likely there will be a metaverse where you can hang out in sort of this Dune metaverse with your friends and have fun, you know, but you don't have to worry about the worms coming to uh, to eat you. Um, and so one of the things I always say, you know, let's, let's not forget that people want to have fun. People want to have enjoyment. And it doesn't matter if it's an enterprise app or what have you. Um, people at the end of the day want to kind of go away with these kind of wonderful connected experiences with other folks. We also want to be able to create immersive worlds, and this is what we'll be able to do with metaverse technology. So, for example, um, how do we bring folks together, right? Um, a good example of this is um, Burning Man, where Burning Man is now in the metaverse. So, to be quite honest with you, I'm never going to Burning Man. Um, I love the concept. I think it's really fun. I got a lot of friends that go, um, but I'm not sort of an outdoors, outdoorsy person. I'm a, you know, what is it called? Glamping? If I'm camping, I'm glamping. Um, and so it was great. I actually was able to go to a Burning Man virtually and be around folks and talk to them and experience the things uh, that they were experiencing right here from this you know, room in my house. And so that's going to be the kinds of things we're going to continue to be able to do. And so a lot of times where people go, oh, I wanted to go to that concert, but I couldn't. Um, it will be nice because a lot of these will now be in the metaverse and we can just go ahead and go to them. Um, and it doesn't even have to be at a particular particular time, right? Because how many times have we wanted to go to a concert and we couldn't go on that, that particular date? Well, now these concerts can be virtual and we can go to them whenever we want, or we can buy that particular experience. And guess what? I don't have to pay the price of, you know, the, you know, being on the front row um, that I would at a normal event, because guess what? everyone can be in the front row, right? There's no need for people to have seats in the back and, you know, seats up front. We all can be there. Um, also, too, we can build these discrete worlds for business to business and business to consumer meetups and network um, events. So we can have these kind of small spaces. And I've worked with a lot of folks uh, who do this kind of thing. And uh, it's really great uh, to, you know, again, have sort of an experience that's sort of tailor made versus like, oh, I'm going to go to a hotel ballroom and, you know, we all get to do minimal things. Whereas, hey, we want to, you know, we want to have a you know party on the, you know, the sun. We can absolutely go ahead and do that. Um, and then the other kind of cool thing is, is that we now can tr we can work with different gameplay mechanics and assets um, in this virtually infinite terrain. Um, you know, it, it's kind of funny because uh, sometimes, um, so in the world, real world, 
there is scarcity, right? There's just ton of ton of scarcity, and it's what drives prices up and things like that. And what's great within the uh, the metaverse is it's ever expanding and growing. So that's why I was always kind of surprised when people were buying virtual real estate um, because real estate is basically halfway speculative, and on the other half, it's also based on where you live because there's only again so much you know space that you can build into but now we can have as much space as we absolutely want to and the same thing with gameplay mechanics um, we can do anything so we can go hey i want to go to different parts of the world through just simply walking through a quote-unquote virtual portal or guess what as humans we can now fly um in this uh in this uh in this place. So it really is kind of one of those things where, you know, we can sort of expand our minds as to what it is we can do in the metaverse. Now, this is where it, it kind of like gets real, right? So uh, I think a lot of folks in the metaverse is sort of this kind of sci-fi, you know, hey, I go to these virtual worlds and hang out and kind of kind of do gaming like stuff, which is absolutely great and, and legitimate. Um, but when it comes to like, hey, businesses who want to pay, um, these are the kinds of things they're thinking about. So for example, how to create a digital representation or a digital twin um, of a shop floor, right? Um, because guess what? Shop floors are very um, chaotic at times. Um, they're very expensive to run. Um, and the thing is, is that uh, you will need to sometimes think about how, for example, um, if you're going to kind of manufacture a new thing, um, you can't just go, well, let's go ahead and, you know, build out everything in there and figure that out. What you can do, though, with the metaverse is you can say, well, let me create a digital twin um, of our operation, and then let's run simulation. So what, what happens? Can we produce cars at a faster rate? Can we produce um, uh, biological breakthroughs, for example? So for example, digital twins, there's actually digital twins of humans um, that are now being used um, instead of bringing folks in and having them like test out a new drug and deal with all the repercussions of that, instead they can say, okay, well, what if we gave this to a digital twin of a human because we know how humans act and respond based on a variety of different uh, factors. And so now we can do this testing, um, number one, much faster than before. And number two, we don't have to actually have to quote unquote experiment on humans um, to do these kinds of uh, things. And then, of course, we can automate and remotely control these real world um, objects um, from various places, and we can actually see what it will look like. So if uh, someone's building out a house and you're not right there, you know, you have to travel or maybe it's very far away, um, you can put on a device and you can see what your house is going to look like in, in the grand scale, in the scale um, that it is. So if you're like, well, will our couch fit? Well, guess what? You can actually go and look at the room itself uh, in, vir in virtual reality and see what that space is uh, going to, to be. And then finally, um, we can visualize 3D content, which is going to allow us to make decisions faster. One of the challenges we deal with today is we learn through a 2D context. So what happens is the world is 3D, right? And how it, uh, how it does everything is 3D. But when we learn, we typically take it from 3D to 2D and then back into our brain in a, in a 3D way. And so cognitively, we're constantly having to do that sort of back and forth between 3D and 2D. So if we learn in a 3D context, um, it makes it much easier. And in fact, um, at the uh, University of uh, British Columbia, um, we worked with them to kind of test this out. And so what they did was they created 3D constructs of the brain and they had some of their health students uh, learn about the brain in that way. And what they found was that they had a sample of people who used um, 3D to learn and people who didn't use uh, 3D to learn. And those that did use the 3D models actually had a grade higher um, than uh, those that uh, didn't. Um, and so this is kind of interesting as we kind of think about these things that we can cognitively um, learn much faster as we begin to think in 3D. Now, in my opinion, all of this does not matter unless humans are safe and secure. Um, people need to be confident and know that uh, their identity is going to be secure. 
because there's a lot of opportunities to um, get information on folks with some of these devices. Um, a good example is uh, eye recognition. Um, we have it built in, for example, into HoloLens so that uh, when you put on the device, it can look at your eyes and that's how you can actually um, uh, sign in to, to the device. Um, and then if someone else puts it on, um, instead of going into your you know, thing, it will be like, oh, you're a new user. Do we want to create an account and, and, and things like that? Um, but it's something we don't make available to developers today, because um, if you all know, um, with the eye, just looking at the eyes, you can find out a lot about people, not just identification, um, but a lot of medical issues and things like that. And so what we do is we want to make absolutely uh, sure, and we have these responsible um, AI and responsible uh, mixed reality teams here at Microsoft um, to help with that because the reality is is that we need to be thoughtful about those things and they need to be built in and not kind of be an afterthought. The other thing too is that we need to build communities with equity and inclusivity from the start. Um, we've done a lot of work around avatars. There's a lot of other companies that have been working around avatars as well. And what, what basically it, avatars boil down to is that uh, people want to either represent themselves and so they want to be able to create something that looks fairly close to who, who they are and somewhat, uh, somewhat recognizable. Um, or they want to take on a different persona or a different look and feel um, for how they feel. Same thing, there's a lot of folks who have body dysmorphia and we want to be cognizant of, of their needs. So what are the things that we can do to make sure that those folks who have dysmorphia um, can feel in a good place when they pick out you know, what their avatars um, are? And so this is something we take very seriously. Um, in fact, my cloud advocacy team, um, we spend a lot of time uh, in this and giving feedback to the product teams to make sure that they understand that we need to um, think about this. And again, it needs to happen from the start. It's not something that you can kind of add on later. It's got to be something that is just fundamental to what it is um, that you do and that we need to represent as many folks, um, you know, as we can. And then also too, we need to have a platform that's open and creator friendly. And so it can be something where, and this is why I'm kind of against the whole one company to rule them all when it comes to the metaverse. I feel that it needs to be all of us collaborating together versus competing together. Because we need something that if you build something, uh, let's say, in Roblox, you should be able to take it to Microsoft Mesh. You should be able to take it to uh, Horizon Workrooms from Meta. You, you know, you should be able to have that ability to take those things that you've done and created um, in, in a kind of the way that we do work with the web today, right? Like you, you don't have to worry about uh, what web browser, you know, should a person use. For the most part, people can use the web browser of their uh, of their choice. And these experiences need to pl take place across a wide array of devices. Um, so this is kind of why I tell folks like the, the big kind of bulky device, um, that's gonna be something we kind of look back at and laugh, right? We'll be like, oh my gosh, do you remember when we used to strap these things on, on our heads um, and how weird uh, we looked? Um, the reality is, is that the metaverse experience is gonna go on an array of devices. So no matter if you don't have a device, you're still going to be able to use your phone or your desktop to participate in these immersive experiences. Now, it may not be the top of the line immersive experience for you, uh, but you will still be able to have a part of that. And that's one of the things I really like that I've seen across all of the folks uh, that we work with and our competitors as well, is they are thinking about how do we make sure that they work on whatever device um, there is, right? And who knows, there might be a new device that comes out and we want to be able to support it. And it's kind of like the web. We want, again, we like, I love the fact that the web is shows up in every device we have in one way or, or another. So I want to talk about use cases. There's a lot of different use cases that uh, exist today. Um, everything from training and learning, which I would say is probably one of the biggest things that people are using these metaverse technologies for. 
um, to virtual concerts like we've talked about, brainstorming, onboarding, and all of those kinds of things. Um, and this is just like the start. Like I'm sure that this slide could be like five times its size with all the different things that uh, we're going to be enabled um, within the metaverse. But this should give you some kind of ideas um, of that. And one of the examples um, that we've uh, done is uh, we've worked with Accenture. So uh, Accenture um, would, has decided that uh, they're going to do all of their collaboration and their new employee uh, training um, through the metaverse. And so here, for example, they're using uh, Microsoft Mesh and our, our Teams product um, to do everything from, like I said, uh, new employee orientation because their employees are all over around the world, um, as well as having uh, meetings. Um, and uh, they also just did something for the World Economic Forum where they built these kind of small immersive experiences um, that enable uh, folks uh, who are attending to see, uh, you know, hey, how is climate change affecting a certain part of the, uh, of the world? And for people to really understand and feel it, versus just like a, you know, a rolling, um, you know, video and things like that. And so this next one that I'm going to show you is actually from Kawasaki, and I'm actually going to let it play. It's real short. It's a minute and uh, 30 seconds. Um, it's all in Japanese, uh, but there will be uh, English captions um, for folks. So let me uh, start that uh, off for you, and hopefully everyone will be able to hear it. で、アジュールカセットを活用して それがまあデジタルツインの世界ができますと、実際現場に行かなくてもそのトラブルの状態が手に取るように分かってそこでもう直すことができると。まあそういったものがですね、仮想空間の中で全部調べれるようになります。完全なるメタバースの世界は開発
So now what will happen is we will get together in meetings, work together, and we may be all across the world um, geographically, but we're all together in this virtual space and we can look at data, how it, how it happens, right? So uh, the California wildfires, for example, um, it would, you know, instead of getting sort of kind of raw, uh, you know, data that has to be kind of transferred and things like that, we could have 3D representations where we could see like, okay, not only where are the fires at, but how fast are each of them going? And we can make very strategic decisions and we can even simulate, right? So if we say, hey, let's do, let's approach this in a very different way, we can simulate that and see what that's going to, to look like and play that, play that simulation um, out. And then in the future, I, or I'm sorry, let me get, you, get, get us to the future. Um, this is where we'll have our interoperable immersive worlds. And this is sort of, again, that North Star that I think we want to get, get towards where you and I um, can decide like, hey, let's go over to this, you know, this experience or this this world, right? And I can, you know, all the things that I've gotten for my avatar come with me, you know, over, over to there. Um, the things work uh, seamlessly. So for example, um, when I create an avatar in one, one place in the metaverse, um, the hand and uh, elbow articulation works exactly the same way. So that it isn't one of those things where, where I created my avatar, when I wave, I wave like this, but then if you go to another place, the wave is like this, right? We wanna make sure that we have the intentions um, that we had created um, in the original space. And so these very interoperable immersive worlds, and a lot of those are starting to exist today, um, but I think we want it to be more of that where I can kind of bounce out and go wherever I want with the thing that I maybe built over here in a different, uh, in a different uh, experience. Now, the thing is, I know a lot of people do not like to make predictions because <laughs> uh, a lot of times you can be wrong, um, but I'm making some predictions and uh, I, I think uh, it's kind of good just for us to think about uh, these kind of things. So uh, my first prediction is these augmented reality, virtual reality devices, they will augment what we do, they will not replace what we do. And it's going to be a lot like the Apple Watch. When the Apple Watch came out, a lot of people thought, oh, we're going to get rid of our phones because we'll do everything via the watch. Um, and we really quickly understood that like, no, you're not going to get rid of your phone. In fact, you do need the phone to use the, uh, use the device. Um, and that the, you can be very successful in that, right? So like the Apple Watch is a super, super successful watch. Any watchmaker out there would love to have the success of, of that device, um, but it will augment what we do. And that's the thing is when I look at all of these things and people start saying, well, no longer will we have like uh, desktops and screens. We'll just sit at, you know, in a blank room staring at a wall and it's gonna be all, you know, minority report, you know, kind of projections. No, that's not what it's going to be. Um, also, the metaverse is going to just feel kind of normalized in four to five years. Um, by the way, this is happening today on TikTok. It is not very, I mean, it's very often that I find people either using a filter to augment how they look, or maybe they put butterfly wings on, on, on themselves. Um, and I don't imagine that any of these folks are saying, ah, I'm going to augment my reality today. <laughs> Instead, what they're doing is they're just using this stuff. And I think that's most likely how it's all going to play out, where we will just one day realize, oh, we're doing all of this metaverse -y, augmented reality stuff, but uh, we're probably going to find ourselves, you know, you know, it's just kind of normal. It'll be what it is. Um, also, glasses will be the consumer form factor of choice. Um, there's just, to be quite honest, there's no way um, that uh, people are going to like walk around with these big, huge things um, on, on their head. There, there's going to be something that looks like glasses. And so we're, there's going to be some challenges there, right? Because how do you, you know, have enough battery in those? And how do you get all of those components in there that you want to, to have these really full fidelity experiences? And uh, there's some that have been built today and that work fairly good. Uh, I like the Unreal uh, work that uh, his has been done, uh, but I feel like glasses will be that consumer form factor of choice, but I think it's probably going to be another 
two years before we see it really sort of uh, taking off and not being sort of a, a novelty or a kind of a science project. And then finally, the metaverse will evolve into the web. Uh, in fact, I've, I've always said, I think the term metaverse will go away at some point because it'll just be in existence, right? And so the web, of course, will be, you know, will sometimes go to a very page-like experience like we have today. And then other times we'll just know like, oh, cool, this is immersive and I can kind of, you know, put on my glasses and, and go and do these uh, kinds of uh, things. And I, I don't remember who said it, but they, they said, much like web and social media, we can't envision what it will look like in five years. And so even my pontification on what I think that the metaverse will look like in five years, it'll probably be very different because if social media was another example, remember, uh, used to be when, you know, Twitter and social media came out, you know, everyone would, you know, be like, Arr, I don't care what someone ate for lunch, right? And I was like, yeah, but there's a lot of people who love to see what their friends are eating for lunch or get, you know, inspired by uh, those ideas. And so the other thing that I always say is don't be too dogmatic about what someone says the metaverse is, even including myself. Um, think about it that it will kind of go, it will kind of grow. Um, and it'll be this very interesting thing that we probably didn't think of that it would uh, be, much like uh, the web, much like uh, mobile devices. So, Last, the next steps, uh, you know, if you've sat through all of this and you're like, wow, this actually seems really interesting, I'd love to, to dig into it. And in addition uh, to the Matthew Wall book, I'd, I'd have you check out a couple of things. Um, one is uh, Microsoft.com slash Mesh. Um, this is our sort of metaverse um, software. Um, so we're using Mesh as our, our kind of collaborative effort around Microsoft to build out these experiences and letting you build those experiences, whether you be a creator or a designer. I know, you know, a lot of times people think, oh, I can only be a part of this if I'm just a code writer. Well, no, like we, we're going to need so much help with like the design of these things. We need um, ethicists, right? We need people who say, hey, when we have a bunch of people in, in a space, how do we make sure that everyone feels comfortable and secure? How do we make sure that if someone says something that we can immediately ban them and dismiss them, right? Uh, that as uh, you know, that puts the onus on the person who did the infraction versus on the the victim themselves. Because a lot of times in these situations, the victim is the one who has to like write to the vendor and say, hey, I'm being harassed in your you know, virtual experience. And that shouldn't ever happen. It should just be something where we really quickly get rid of the problem and that. So Microsoft.com slash mesh. And then if you're just like, hey, I, I want to see it all, right? You want to learn about virtual reality, or maybe you're an IT ops person, right? And you're wondering like, what is it that I can do to be a part of this world? Um, we have really great uh, documentation for here. And of course, if there's anything in the documentation you don't see, please let us know. We work very closely with our documentation um, folks to make sure that it represents uh, what people are looking at and wanting to uh, do. So whether you're a design, again, a designer, a creator, a developer, an ops person, we want uh, your insights because we want to make sure that the documentation is good for you. So I know that I have gone through quite a bit uh, and quite fast. Uh, I get excited talking about the metaverse, I apologize. Um, but uh, I, I think this is really an exciting place because it is something that we're at the forefront of this. We're at the beginning of it. So number one, you know, you're in a good place because you're going to be going into the industry at, at a point where they're going to need your skill sets. Um, number two, um, you are going to help decide how things work, right? Like we still are trying to figure out like what the best um, interactions are, right? Like for example, our HoloLens, which you see here in version one, we use this uh, one particular gesture to do a lot of things. Well, guess what? We learned that that gesture is actually fairly hard for people. So now what we're trying to do is to go to a more natural gesture. So for example, if I want to grab a garden gnome hologram, I can grab them like this or grab them like that and kind of move move it around. I don't have to kind of 
get get it just right and to you know pick that pick that uh, garden gnome up and so we've got a lot of great work to do so this is a, a, a really great space where it's not like oh well i'll just learn this one thing and then i'm totally done this is a space where you'll get to learn and grow and create and you know you can decide like hey maybe i want to be you know an entrepreneur and build out this wonderful thing but i just want to say thank you very much I really do appreciate uh, the time uh, you've given uh, me. Um, and uh, please check out these links. Please reach out to me. I'd love to help. Um, you know, we're going to open it up for Q&A now, and I'll be glad to answer any questions I, I can, um, you know, as long as you're not asking for company secrets. Uh, or if you're asking my opinion, I can give you the, that as well. And for those, again, the introverts, you know, I feel you. I'm an introvert myself. Um, if you want to just like send me, a, you know, a LinkedIn, you know, uh, you know, a LinkedIn message or DM, DM me on Twitter, I'm glad to follow up with uh, that as well. And uh, again, if you're looking at, hey, I have some questions or I'm looking at, you know, like how to get a job in this space, how, how should I think about it? I'm glad to help out uh, with those as well. So uh, with that, again, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, let's open it up to uh, questions. Thank you so much, Thomas, for doing this talk. Um, let's give him a big round of applause, however you want to show it. Emotes, chat messages, turn your mic on, however you want to do that. This was really insightful for me, at least. Um, so I think while while people have a chance to think about their questions or to post things in chat, and if, if you don't have a mic today and you want to post things in text, I'm happy to read off your questions as well, um, if you want to put them there. Um, while that's happening, um, start with a question on all of this. I want to ask about what your thoughts are on kind of the, the level of, at least when I talk about the metaverse um, and this concept of this interop interoperability between different platforms or, or worlds, I want to refer to it. Um, in your mind, how far off, you know, thinking about like Microsoft Mesh, are we from Having a, a like a either a standard or a, a way to define states between these different platforms, virtual worlds that you know we can transfer transfer assets, um, emotion or like or like avatar states between them. I think that's a really big piece of how this all comes together, right? In terms of how you how you do cross across these different places. Yeah, um, it, and it is. It, it's probably one of the bigger problems to to solve, right? Because uh, you know, you know, if you look at just one gaming engine, right? It's usually a very custom thing, right? Like we do have things like Unity and uh, Unreal and and things like that. Um, but when you really start getting into some of these larger games. Um, they all kind of do things different and they do it their own way, right? And they've been building it all along, um, you know, and they always will believe that they built it, they build it a much better engine than anyone else could ever do. And so this has been a big challenge. Now, there is something called the Metaverse Forum, and I hope I'm getting, getting it right, um, that is um, doing, a, that is trying to kind of address these issues, right? Of like, hey, how do we all work together and, you know, and be a part of a, of a solution where, yes, you know, these avatars, you know, work in the way that they, they do. Um, this is going to be sort of a, a grassroots thing, in my opinion, right? Because, you know, it, in, it's not just for people who are like hosting, right? So like we will host these immersive experiences, Meta hosts these, uh, these immersive experiences, but at the same time, you have to have the tool makers thinking about this as well. So for example, Blender, right? Blender is a wonderful open source tool. Um, does it work in the same way or it is the output of these uh, 3D objects the same way? Um, most of the time they're not, right? And that's why, you know, I've, I, I, I enjoy the experiments that I see sometimes on Twitter and LinkedIn where, uh, you know, a person will be like, okay, I tried to take my same object and I tried to put it over here and like, the you know the person the person walking you know instead of being straight up and walking they're kind of leaned back right or they're doing like a one I saw was a spider crawl right and they were like I did not do this on purpose it's just that's how it took in that object and kind of looked at the body splines and how it was going to react uh, to that so I do think that this is something that's probably going to take a couple of years um, to get right. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm going to put it a little further. I'm going to say 
three to four years. Because I think what's probably going to happen is folks are going to put their stuff out, right? Because they're just trying to get to, hey, minimum viable product. Let me see if we have c- customer fit. But I think it's going to accelerate because, in my opinion, you have to get avatars right. So my, my view of the world is we're going to start with avatars, then immersive meetings, right? So like this meeting today, and then actual immersive experiences where, okay, we're not just meeting here. We're actually like now, you know, in this kind of, we're on a digital campus, right, of, of with you all. So you got to get avatars right. Um, and you have to get people familiar with avatars um, because I'm telling you, it's polarizing what I get when I come on to these as, as my avatar. And so I have people who are like, that's really cool. How did you get that? How do I enable that in Teams and all that stuff? Then I got people who are like, oh my gosh, you're one of those people, <laughs> right? Um, and this is again why I'm going to give my, you know, I'm going to give kudos to Japan because Japan is very, um, you know, culturally associated to, to use of avatars. And so there isn't as much of a like, oh, why would I want to use an avatar instead of myself? Um, they're very open to like, hey, yeah, avatars can be used, um, you know, and we they don't see sort of the kind of uncanny valley um, that perhaps uh, we do as well. So you got to get the, you got to get people comfortable with avatars because that's the big piece. Then, like I said, you then go to those immersive meetings and then immersive experiences. And I think that's kind of what we're going to see over the next you know, handful um, of years before we get to this, hey, everything is interoperable to, together. I, I think we're basically going to go through our browser wars again in some way. Um, just I don't know exactly when that will be, but I think we will go through that. Thank you. I was wondering um, if you have ideas of what the metaverse integrating that into the web looks like. So I feel like that's an interesting concept to think about. Yeah, um, what a lot of folks are thinking about is um, is you know the the a typical portal into an immersive experience. So you would go to a typical website like you do today, um, but there'll be a, a little, and there hasn't been standardization, which I really think it, there should be, of a, a thing that looks like a, a dev- head, head-worn device. And you click on that, and that does the assumption of like, okay, you want to go outside of sort of the browser construct, and now you want to be immersed um, in this. But then when you get to that, you then have to start thinking about, well, in the internet, I can click a link and I can go to someplace else. And so what do those portals look like? And one of the things that we've been really cognizant to tell people about is a portal should show me what I'm about to walk into. Because what we don't want to do is to have people get hijacked, right? So they click on a link and it puts them in a really dark webby kind kind of place. And so what we need to do is to figure out like, hey, how do we make sure that, you know, before someone kind of jumps to that portal, where where it is that they they go. Um, The the other part of the the challenge is, um, so we've got WebXR today, right? So we've got the technologies and everyone's building towards that. So that's kind of nice that if you build with any kind of tool, typically it's going to use WebXR. So we're all using the same standards. And in fact, WebXR even has like the, the devices that you're using, the hand tracking controllers. That's all being, that, that's all being sort of standardized in, in how it works. And so you've got standardization, you've got security, and then you've got experience. And the, the hard part is, is that experience part. No one has created the default, right? Of like, here's how a portal works. This is like, I don't know much about it, but I guess I was curious, like why, where Google Glass like falls on the spectrum and like why you think that maybe like failed or like wasn't very successful when it came out? I think there were two parts to that. Um, One is, I think it was timing. So at the time of Google Glass, there was a very, there was a lot going on in sort of the ecosystem of privacy, right? So 
people were finding out, oh, people are hacking, you know, our cameras on our on our machines, right? And we didn't have sort of the thoughtfulness of like, yeah, I'll put this flap down so that people can't see if perhaps if they got it in, in charge of my computer. Um, also, too, um, because it was taking pictures and people didn't always know that it was doing it, it, it felt creepy, right? Um, and then to be quite honest, if you ever hung around, and how do I say this gently? When you hung around people who wore them, uh, they tended not to be engaged with you. So like everyone would be talking and then they would just be like this. And so you were like, what the heck are you doing over there, right? So it was this weird thing. And to be quite honest, a, they focused a lot on the techies and the techies who were wearing these things were not people that you would look to, right? Because we all look to our peers as the people that we want to emulate. It's when our friends go, hey, I got these cool glasses that do this. Then we go, oh yeah, I, I think that's cool. I'd want that. The people who were wearing them, to be quite honest with you, weren't there. And then the other thing is, is that when anyone puts something on their body, it is a represent, it's a representation of themselves, right? And, and that's whether you, you know, quote unquote, dress up or if you dress down, right? There's folks who, you know, purposely wear grungy clothes. You know, if you, if you think about it back in the grunge days, people purposely wore grungy clothes and there was something that was being said through that. These glasses just had no, had this very sterile proposition. So people were like, why do I want to wear this when it just freaks people out? The experience in them wasn't the best. Um, and like I said, they did look very odd until finally they went and got some designers. That's why, to be quite honest, um, Meta or Facebook, they did the smartest thing. They went to Ray-Ban and they said, you create the glasses will create the technology, which was super smart, right? Because honestly, you don't want Mark Zuckerberg designing eyewear. You want someone who actually knows this stuff and Ray-Ban absolutely knew it. So they did a great job of making something that people would actually wear. And like I have the Ray-Bans and I wear them because I, I have them as a, a prescription sunglasses. And I really like them. And I also like the fact that if someone is recording, I'm I'm seeing, you know, the red, you know, dot or the green dot there. And so uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I kind of went a bunch of different directions, but that's sort of how it all kind of played together. So I think it wasn't like one thing that that made it not go well. I think it was, hey, there was just all these things that worked uh, worked against it. And my hope is, is that now they still have glass, by the way. Um, but they have now kept a very low key. They use it for enterprise scenarios. Um, it's in a very small group. I don't think you can actually buy them directly as a consumer, but uh, they, they've kind of learned their ways and they won't ever do it again. And by the way, same thing with us. Like when we have talked about it internally, everyone always goes, okay, how do we make sure that we don't look like Google Glass or do the same thing they did? Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Hi, so I have a question uh, regarding like the standard that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. I was like wondering, um, I know like Pixar has started like the universal sin description project. It's like a open source like years ago and like seems like lots of company are involved in that. And I know like uh, in the Omniverse, like from NVIDIA, they actually use lots of USD and seems like that standards that what they are working toward. And I wonder if Microsoft are also like cooperate with like those external um, sources or you're building your own standard for this like HTML 3.0, something like that. Yeah, well, great question. Um, so, you know, first off, uh, Microsoft learned its lesson with uh, the old versions of IE. Um, so uh, we are definitely um, not going to kind of build out our own thing if we feel that there is something else is just as good or better than what we would build. Um, also, too, um, as, a, as a part of being a part of these things like the Metaverse Forum, you know, it's, it's implied that we want to work with, you know, 3D asset files that are, you know, that are, you know, are 
already sort of in the works and, and doing well. So like, it's not unusual to take uh, .obj files and be able to work with them in any of the tools that, uh, that we have and the things that we think about. Um, we focus a lot on Unity and uh, Unreal as engines for, for the work that, uh, that we do. Um, in fact, we also sometimes will uh, rework our own software and take advantage instead. So like, for example, some of the things that uh, Unity does very well, we're like, well, why are we building our own thing when Unity has this built in and does a, does a much better job? So let's, let's build on top of that. So for us, absolutely, like GLTB files, we very much uh, support those uh, as well. And our, in, our intention is basically to support all the files that are out there. And, uh, you know, I am unaware, you know, maybe there's, a, you know, a research project going on somewhere at, at Microsoft, because there's like 200,000 people at Microsoft. But um, as far as I know, there is no, uh, there's no work being done on coming up with a uh, a different kind of file because we do believe that the GLTB files, especially, um, and then uh, 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 Apple, who likes to kind of do their own thing all the time. Um, I forget their file format, but that that file format looks pretty good as as well. Uh, so I think what we'll find is uh, we'll we'll battle like anything else when it comes to file formats, um, and we'll kind of find the ones that uh, will kind of result uh, in the best. But in my opinion it's gotta be something that just works across everything. Like if something is just gonna be very specific to one platform, I don't think that that's gonna work very well. Yeah, thank you. And um, I wonder like, uh, does that mean like the, like the whole ecosystem are gonna to come to a agreement that you're gonna use a, like a certain sort of file or, it's a more like you can have different formats, but all like software will interpret like those files in the same way and like rendering or generate the same thing. Yeah, so the first thing you brought up, that would be the easiest, right? If we all just said, hey, this is the file format we're all gonna agree on. Um, the second one is very, very hard to build, right? Because it's like, okay, not only are these all these different file formats that we need to support, but at the same time, we need to make sure that they work on all of these various uh, immersive uh, platforms. Um, I un unfortunately sometimes I'm I'm a bit of a, a tech a tech pessimist in that uh, companies are going to do what works best for them, right? And so if they feel that they can have their own sort of proprietary thing and try to like force that thing across. Um, all the all the industry. They, that's kind of where they will prefer. What we have to do as developers, designers, creators, builders, is we have to push against that, right? And that's exactly what my team does. Anytime anyone, you know, has sort of a project that they're working on internally, and we feel that, hey, you're kind of creating a moat, or you're kind of creating this very proprietary thing, um, you know, we think you should do otherwise. And, and I think that's what it's going to be. It's, it's going to be this kind of grassroots thing, much like the web, right? Where we had all these browser wars, right? And, you know, people were constantly, well, it will work in this browser, but not this browser. And then there was the one dominant browser, right? It's Google Chrome. Uh, mm -hmm. But we, then we found out like, hey, that, that wasn't a good thing either. So now what do we do? Well, let's try to see if we can kind of go at the rendering engine level. And I think that's, that's kind of the nirvana that we will get to on this. Um, but I think we're still early and it's, we're going to have to just see um, how it does. Because also too, it's going to be dependent on vendors' um, willingness to put resourcing into it as well, right? Because like, you know, if you're going to be in one of these foundations or forums, you usually have to pay the membership. You used to, you have to have people who sit on these panels and on these projects and things like that and work through these standards. And it's not it's not easy work. And so those that kind of participate in those, they will get to help sort of drive the standards a bit more. Um, but I just, yeah, I just don't see like everyone just agreeing and going, okay, we're only going to use GLTB. I wish, make our lives a hundred times easier, mm -hmm. but tech companies just don't ever seem to work uh, that way. <laughs> I see. And is it like using this agreement will take like three to four years because you were mentioning we're like still at like the beginning stage and it will take like many years uh, like how do you feel like those many years will be spending 
what I think, what I think the challenge that a lot of folks don't understand, especially journalists um, in particular, because they're always, you know, the, they will hype something that's done in this space, like the metaverse, right? Like, you know, f- there was about six months there where you couldn't, you know, read any tech thing without metaverse being a part of it. And everybody was announcing their metaverse initiatives and things like that. But as soon as that happened, the hype ki- curve kicked in and it was all these people going, well, the metaverse is dead. Right. And they would say, oh, well, because Meta lost a whole bunch of money on their, their on their investment, which they didn't lose any money. They just invested in the space and they made a strategic de- decision. But a lot of times what happens is, is that we want to say, like, oh, this is going to work and it's not and it's not going to be any good. Um, we've got that. And so with that and with sort of COVID and everything else things slowed down quite a bit, right? And we're kind of having macroeconomic uh, pressures of a, of a depression that's possibly coming. We don't know. That's why you've seen a lot of uh, uh, tech companies that are uh, letting people go. Um, but that's cyclical, right? Like, you know, five years from now, we might, uh, we might grow there. But within the next two to three years, what it is that we'll be doing is we'll be working on this stuff because this stuff is very hard. Like when you really kind of sit down and you kind of work through like, what does it take to build an augmented reality device? I mean, there are there are like a million things like we have to worry about shooting a laser in your eye. Right. And that's not something that you can just like, hey, let's write some you know simple code to handle that. Like, no, like you're you're literally bending physics. And a lot of the folks that we have on board are trying to figure out like, hey, how do we use physics to our advantage to do these kind of amazing things? Um, So I think we're going to have just, again, that very sort of soft start with avatars, right? So instead of it being, here's the metaverse, boom, here it is. It's going to start with, hey, here's avatars. Here, let's get comfortable with those. Then let's do these meetings and stuff. Because by the way, it's really hard to do large events. So if we said, hey, let's do a thousand person uh, concert, can you imagine the amount of compute that it takes for us to relay a thousand body uh, projections in real time. And that's one of the things that Matthew Ball talks about uh, in his book. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes lots of sense. So you actually feel like for people to understand and accept like the concept of metaverse and the new format of living like are going to take like multiple years. I I think, yeah, I think what you're going to see is, um, I think you'll see in a couple of years, a lot of good experiences. Like I I think there'll be a lot of things that uh, we're going to be able to do. I think there'll be a lot of stuff that we do like with Kawasaki and stuff in Accenture, like you saw, um, that's gonna be sort of behind a wall, right? So I, I, I think the consumer type of stuff is going to take a bit longer. And I think the augmented reality part is going to take longer. I think anything virtual reality, we can do pretty well today. We've just got to do some additional work there. But yeah, I would say for the next couple of years, you're going to see very much a focus on sort of virtual reality. Four years, I think that's when you're going to really see augmented reality and you start to see the glasses uh, form factor for it. I see. Thank you. Thanks. Good questions. I have one more question I think I'll, I'll throw out there because I think you hinted to it a little bit in your talk and it's definitely the, the, the big buzzy topic right now in, in tech. Um, but especially with the direction that AI synthesis is going right now, um, what, are, what are your predictions for how that's going to factor in kind of to future metaverse technologies? You talked a little bit about digital twins and simulations. Um, but I think there's kind of a difference between being able to kind of generate these simulations ourselves versus having AI either visually or, in, you know, we've seen it, we've seen it with videos, images, 3D models, text, every different iteration now. Where, where do you see AI going in terms of integration for, for the first of synthesis into metaverse platforms? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's definitely going to be, uh, you know, a big part of the metaverse um, because we we do need these things, right? Like machine learning, for example, um, we uh, we do machine learning in our Hololens device, right? So we have a holographic, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
CPU um, or GPU that's built into the device, and it does machine learning stuff on on, on that. So I see the 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 various things you know kind of playing in into this. Um, I think I think we will have to wait and see where where all of this takes us. Because um, again, I, I'm a I'm always. I'm usually the, always the person that uh, folks who are really excited about AI go, ah, you're kind of a downer. And then the people who are like really against AI are like, why are you propping AI up when it's when it's a fad? Um, I don't think it is a fad. I think that uh, what we are seeing now with things like chat GPT is the realization that there's very practical things that uh, that we can do. Um, I am not of the belief that, uh, okay, com you know, computers are now going to take over us and, uh, you know, we're we're, we're going to have this very dystopian future. I think that what we're going to do is we're going to have things that are going to make our lives easy. Uh, remember, you know, computers used to be run in assembly language, right, where we had to worry about registers and, uh, and you know, moving bits, right? And now people don't even think about that, right? And most people don't even have to think about that when they, when they work through this. So I I have the feeling that you know AI definitely is gonna gonna play a role in this. In fact, I feel like it has to because of all the real time stuff that we're going to um, expect. And so we need the AI to understand that. Now I think probably the biggest challenge that we're gonna have is probably around responsible AI because. Um, you know, people people want to do things that they want to do. So, like I remember, for example, I was talking to one um, company. They were a gaming company, and they wanted uh, access to um, bio data, right? And so, what their hope was was that uh, when you were in their game, because it was a horror game, um, they wanted to scare you, and they wanted to see how badly they were scaring you. So, for example, if they found out that you were deathly afraid of clowns. Well, guess what? You were going to see more clowns. Um, if jump scares were your thing, then uh, they were going to amp up the jump scares. And if they saw that you were getting kind of used to the, that kind of jump scare, then they'd give you a different jump scare. Um, and we just said no to them. <laughs> we, we, said, we said, we're not interested in working with you uh, on this project because you you know, we could never see the end of where they were going, right, with this. Um, and I would say these these folks were, you know, when we talked to them, they weren't bad people, right? They weren't like, ah, you know, rolling their, you know, mustache and going, you know, ah, we're going to scare the you know, heck out of these people and warp their minds. It wasn't that. They thought like, oh, we just want to create these like really great experiences. But the thing is, is that in VR, your your mind is in a very different place, right? So like if you watch a horror movie, you know nothing's coming out of the TV, right? And you can kind of in your head like really quickly go, this is something that was created and manufactured to scare me. And so you can kind of take yourself out of it. I watch all kinds of horror movies. I'm a big horror fan. I cannot do horror in VR. I've tried. I've You know, it'll be like, oh, try this horror trick. I can't. I get freaked out. And so we have to pay particular attention. And again, this is where AI, and this is part of our responsible AI principles, AI augments the human experience. It doesn't replace it. And so that's where I think we're going to have to be more, most careful with, a, with AI, because as we've seen, you know, with some of these AIs, we can talk to them for a long enough time where they start talking like a human. Right. And most of us know, OK, yeah, this AI isn't human. But, you know, what happens when you start thinking about, you know, robotics? Right. When someone said, oh, we can now deal. We can talk to these robots via chat GPT. And I just immediately I was like, uh, is that the good, best idea? Like, well, maybe we should talk more about that. And and that's the thing. And, and I think everyone should always question. And this is what we do internally is should we be doing this? Does this make sense? Are we doing this just as kind of a science project or could this potentially harm um, underrepresented folks or uh, folks who you know, have, uh, have different uh, comorbidities? So we need to think more about those kinds of things. So AI, I'm, I'm bullish on it, but I'm also going to be very careful when people say, here's the next cool thing, because we might find that uh, that next cool thing actually is detrimental. Very even stance, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, this is the last call for questions. Thomas has posted his content information. I believe you said you're open to LinkedIn messages, Twitter DMs, emails, whatever. Absolutely. I, I didn't put my email on this one because I think it is going out on YouTube uh, and there's only so much time I have. Um, but you, John has my email. David has my email. So if there is a reason why you want to just reach out to me directly, um, please feel free to uh, to do so. Um, and I'm also always on board for what I call coffee chats, which are 25 minutes. So if you're like wanting to ask more questions, if you're wanting to think about how, how you know, hey, I'm a designer and I want to get into the metaverse space, how should I think about it? What are the things that I should do? Glad to help uh, support that, uh, you know, as as well. So uh, yeah, please feel free to reach out to me. And again, thank you so much. I really enjoy, I wish I could have done this uh, in person, um, but I enjoy talking with you all. And uh, yeah, you know, hopefully uh, you'll invite me back to talk more about all this good stuff. Yeah, thank you so much for doing this today. Uh, fantastic talk. Great questions today from everyone. Thank you all for being here. I'll give one more round of applause for Thomas. Uh, again, you can reflect that however you'd like to. But thank you so much for, for joining us today.